Hi, I'm Braddock District Supervisor James Walkinshaw. Thanks for tuning in to Braddock Voices, where we talk to Braddock District and Fairfax County residents and leaders who are working to make our wonderful community even better. To stay up to date with future episodes, community news, and local events, sign up for our Braddock District email list. It's easy. Just contact us at braddock at fairfaxcounty.gov and we'll subscribe you. Before we introduce our, our guest today, uh, I am going to do, as we usually do, our animal spotlight. Uh, this is an animal who is currently available for adoption at the Fairfax County Animal Shelter. I'm happy to introduce this episode's four-legged friend spotlight, Melly. Melly is an eight-year-old American Staffordshire Terrier looking for a new family. Melly is eight years old, and we know what you might be thinking, too old. But the animal shelter assures you that Melly is still a young dog in all the right ways. She's playful, she's fun, she shares her toys. What is Melly's downfall? Her leash manners. She can be a bit mean when she sees other dogs on her walk, but given how well she behaves 95% of the time, the animal shelter thinks that someone out there will be willing to manage Melly on her walks, and she has responded well to reward-based training while in their care. She's a perfect companion for someone willing to help her polish up. Interested in meeting Melly? Call the animal shelter at 703-830-1100 and request a meeting. If Molly has found a new home by the time you call, don't worry. The animal shelter can still help you find your future best friend. And with that, I'm very excited to uh, introduce our guest today, Tyler Cowan. And I'm going to start, I'm going to quote from a 2010 Washington Post profile, which I think summarizes Tyler pretty well. Economist of daily life, reader of five books a day, polymath blogger, and food explorer. The formal biography, uh, Tyler is the Harris Chair of Economics at George Mason University, Chairman and Faculty Director of the Mercatus Center, co-author of the economics blog Marginal Revolution, and host of the uh, wildly successful podcast, Conversations with Tyler, author of a Bloomberg View column, and author of several best-selling books, including The Complacent Class, uh, published in 2017. Uh, Tyler, welcome to the show. Thank you. My pleasure. I want to start um, with The Complacent Class and let you connect that to Fairfax County or not. Uh, first, let me summarize the the thesis of the complacent class is I, I recently reread it as a reader um, interpreted it, and you can correct me if it's wrong. Americans have abandoned their spirit of restlessness and dynamism in favor of uh, comfort and security. We've seen less risk-taking, less business creation, less moving, physically moving of residences, more efficient matching of mates and life partners, more efficient matching in terms of residents and the neighborhoods that we live, and even music. Much easier to find the kind of music you enjoy on Spotify than it was when you used to have to go to the record store. All of these are um, facts, I think, um, easily proven or disproven. Uh, but you go a step further and assert that the result of this complacency will be increasingly unaffordable housing in desirable areas. I think Fairfax County would be one of those areas, but you can talk more about that. Increasing residential segregation uh, by socioeconomic status and by race, and an overall decline in work ethic, which translate into a decline in economic productivity. Is that an accurate summarization? Yes, that's a very good summary. The complacent class mentions Fairfax County several times and uses a couple anecdotes uh, from your time living here, which has been how many years? Well, I first lived here, I think, in 1980 for three years, lived here again for one year in 1987, and then have lived here more or less continuously since 1989. So that's almost 35 years in total, a okay. big chunk of my 59-year-old adult life. All right, wonderful. Um, so you use several anecdotes from that time, but, but Fairfax isn't the focus of the book. Uh, my question for you is Fairfax County complacent, and if so, how? I think most parts of the United States and indeed the Western world have become complacent. Fairfax County is not an exception to that. 
I think the fact that we have above average federal government employment makes us somewhat more complacent than other demographically similar areas. Uh, but I would stress that if you want to overturn things, it's best to live in a complacent area, right? So you can create your own change in your life by your activities. Uh, complacency in some ways is underrated. You want a good school system. You want nice homes, nice county parks, which we have. And uh, I've chosen to live here, right, most of my life. So in that sense, I am complacent, but it's also a portfolio issue. So if you're having to, say, live in Manhattan and fend off the garbage not being collected, mm -hmm. it's harder for you to create. So is that's one of the reasons that you have chosen to stay in Fairfax County. So the relative complacency perhaps is correlated with convenience that frees you up to focus on the things you want to focus on. It fits my portfolio. It is near three wonderful airports, which is important. And again, think of this in portfolio terms. It is multicultural. It has made immigration work better than probably anywhere else in the United States. And you said it was expensive. O obviously, that's true. But if you compare it to the Bay Area, Tri-State Area, Los Angeles, even Boston, it's actually relatively reasonable. You can buy a very nice home in many very good parts for less than a million dollars, which in those other parts is unthinkable. So in that sense, relative to quality, it's quite cheap. Let's talk about housing because that's you, you, you took us there, but that's a place that I wanted to go in this context. So if you look at the population of Fairfax County uh, and the time that you've lived here off and on and the time that I've been alive, I uh, spent a lot of time living here also, from 1980 to 2015, the population of Fairfax County grew pretty dramatically, almost doubled, 600,000 to 1.1 million people. And the diversity has increased. So in 1980, the Asian population was about 4%. Today, it's almost 20%. Uh, Hispanic population then was 3%. It's almost 20%. Black population, not as significant an increase, 6% to 10%. So we've seen this growing diversity, but, and you talk about this in your book, and you, you have an anecdote about playing basketball in, in Vienna and seeing more diversity then than you feel like exists now. And, you know, I, I went back and did some research to try to confirm that. And I think your impression uh, of increasing segregation in terms of housing in Fairfax County is, is accurate. So we do uh, have to do, federal government requires an analysis and impediments for the Fair Housing Act periodically. And the most recent one uh, went through 2015, and it showed just that, whereas the overall diversity of Fairfax County has increased dramatically, and we all see that and feel that, there's also been an increase in housing segregation. So Latinos and Asians in Fairfax County uh, became more integrated, but black households did not become more integrated in Fairfax County. And they, they also did an analysis that controls for household income because you know, I, I have wrestled with this issue, how much of it is related to affordability and socioeconomic segregation and how much of it is race and can we solve it all if we solve the affordability question on its own? This analysis suggests that we can't. Uh, they did a free market analysis that controls for household income and still finds that discrimination. And in the Fairfax Planning District, which is the neighborhoods around George Mason University, including part of my district, uh, controlling for income that planning district should be made up of households, 17.6% of whom are black. It turns out it's only 7.5%, whereas the Asian and Latino households are about where they would expect to be in terms of household income. So we have this dual housing market, and there's an affordability factor with socioeconomic segregation, but also clearly a racial factor where through some combination of choice, um, self-steering out of fear of discrimination, actual steering on, beha on behalf of uh, you know, the housing industry, the mortgage industry, that we still see this discrimination. How, what are the tools that government can use to try to address that? I think even within the category of blacks, one needs to disaggregate. Uh, people disagree about the proper terminology here, but think of what you might call original American blacks versus people who are migrants or immediately children of migrants 
typically from Africa, more so than the Caribbean for Fairfax County, and typically from East Africa. So I think no matter what policy we do, the long run equilibrium here is for a ever higher share of the black population to be directly, more recently, from Africa, probably mm -hmm. East Africa, uh, for a variety of historically complex reasons, Africans have found the notion of living near a nation's capital to be a very appealing one. I think some of that is in many African nations. The capital is a center in many regards, mm -hmm. and it's considered to be the place you would go to get ahead. It's not quite true in the United States because D.C. is a, a small metropolitan area in some ways. But nonetheless, life here is good, and there's a, a sense of chain migration. There's wonderful, say, Ethiopian food, Sudanese food, uh, Eritrean food. So I think given that immigration is you know, basically positive selection, that this will be one of the major centers for what you might call African migrant life in the United States. Uh, I don't know that policy can change that. It seems to me the original American blacks who say might have lived here 30 years ago, uh, there's a lot of migration to the Carolinas, which are doing well, you know, to be clear, but they're cheaper. And uh, I don't think that's going to be reversed. And in terms of housing policy, um, I know you and the Mercatus Center have been advocates for decreasing government restrictions on housing, decreasing uh, rules and regulations around exclusionary housing. How far would that take us in integrating uh, neighborhoods? If you consider Fairfax County, I think you would have much higher Latino uh, integration with cheaper housing and more building. I think that would be the major effect. And uh, poorer Asian migrant groups, say Vietnamese on average have lower per capita income here than do Korean Americans or Chinese Americans. I think that would be a noticeable effect. Um, you know, Fairfax County in the past has been fairly willing to build things. Loudoun County, mm -hmm. extremely willing to build things. So we're not the worst practitioners of NIMBYism. We practice NIMBYism at the neighborhood level. Like try getting a new big development put in Mantua, where I live. Right? It's not going to happen, really. Right. But we find somewhere else to put it. Now, at some point, we're going to run out of that strategy. But I don't actually think yet. And I think we're through e-commerce, we're freeing up a lot of what had been retail mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. And for us to use that wisely and sometimes for residential purposes might be the new YIMBY for Fairfax County. And it, it might even be nursing homes or a child care center that indirectly will encourage families to have more kids. Uh, so thinking about repurposing the retail we had invested in seems to be a, a major decision before us. Yeah, and, and that is something that the board has, has looked at in streamlining the process for businesses to convert buildings from commercial use to a residential use. It does tend to be more expensive for the developer than, than people expect because if you look at building costs, the shell of the building tends not to be the most significant cost. It's doable, but more expensive than people think. And in terms of you know, freeing up land. I represent a district that is predominantly um, neighborhoods of single family homes, not Mantua, but like Mantua. Um, and we have just pockets of available land for multifamily housing development. One piece, one pocket that we're looking at is this parking lot that you just came in on. Uh, you And you were here not too long ago for a, a vaccine for a family member. So you're familiar with the parking. Was that parking lot full out there today? Was there any available parking? Uh, there was some, or I wouldn't be here. Yeah, right? but, yeah. <laughs> there's so a lot of space there. Yeah, there is a lot of parking there. So one of the things we're moving forward to do is actually build housing out there uh, on that parking lot, use up a couple hundred of the parking spaces and still have plenty of parking. So there are pockets of land around the county like, like that, obviously obviously decreasing. Um, one you of must, Go ahead. Uh, you must know the neighborhood of Pimmett Hills, right? I do, yes. It's in Falls Church. I think another major decision Fairfax County faces is what to do with that kind of neighborhood, which has a large number of homes that an economist might say are inefficiently small. Yep. But being inefficiently small keeps them cheap. Yep. And uh, it's a policy decision how many conversions to allow, even just 
one house to one house. It doesn't have to be big, tall apartment blocks. Mm -hmm. And I suspect over time what will win out is upgrading the quality of those homes. That will, for me, make Fairfax County more boring. Uh, I suspect it's the correct thing to do for the county, for the revenue base, for economic growth. Uh, but I think you know one can be genuinely torn about that decision. Yeah. In part, we create affordable housing by making it quote unquote bad, not by making it dense. Yeah, and that won't last forever. So it's f a market rate affordable housing that exists there now. But you're predicting that when those homes are 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 eventually when their useful life ends or the economics dictate, they'll be upgraded to something that's less affordable than it is now. Correct, but right yeah. now an upper income person is not going to bid on a Timot Hills home yeah. because the rooms are too small and there aren't enough of them. And the size of like house to backyard and basement, yeah. every, everything, none of it makes sense. It's like very 1947 or something, which yeah. was a great time, yeah. but it's 2021. Yeah, I mean, you know, th and this is kind of a hobby horse of mine on the board, and, and I'll be quite honest, there's not much of a political constituency for it here, but it is the argument that new market rate housing actually new market rate not i'm not even talking about affordable housing i'm talking about expensive luxury market rate housing helps us to preserve some of those lower end affordable units that exist and i i use the example of my grandparents and they moved here to fairfax county to annandale to an apartment complex off of americana drive that i, I now i now represent in annandale and when they moved there in the late 60s, early 70s, it was a luxury apartment building. Um, you know, top high-end, high, high top-of-the-line luxury apartment building by Fairfax County standards. Uh, had a washer and dryer. If you went down and walked down into the basement and shared it with everyone else, right? That was high-end at the time. Today, those are market-rate affordable apartments that you can still get for a relatively affordable monthly rent. The reason that they have moved down that affordability scale relative to everything else in Fairfax is because other things have been built. And if we don't build other things, other market rate units, those luxury units will remain luxury units and will never move down the affordability scale. Yes, that makes sense. You mentioned Annandale, by the way. I once wrote a blog post, half tongue in cheek, but only half or I suggested Annandale was the greatest town in all of America. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, li I like Annandale. You know, it gets, it gets a bad rap. Um, but obviously, you could talk for hours, I'm sure, about the dining options in Annandale. Uh, it's still, as I noted right now, in addition to that, provides affordable, market-rate affordable housing for a lot of people Absolutely. who need it. It is incredibly vibrant and dynamic. There's nothing complacent uh, about, about Annandale. So it has that going forward, and I, I, I think it is a great place. Isn't Thomas Jefferson High School in Annandale? It is, yeah. Not if it is, it is. So one of them. It is. It is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Fantastic food. You have a connection yep. to the Beltway. Yep. Very close connection to Interstate 95. Yep. One of the most affordable places around, but complete access to Washington and everything else. Yep. So it's one of America's uh, greatest towns. And I think, you know, I represent only a sliver of central Annandale inside the Beltway. But I think the big challenge in Annandale is striking that balance between um, redevelopment uh, and maintaining the affordable housing that, that exists there now. And that's a difficult balance to to strike that we have to think about on the board. But clearly... It's a place that could benefit from um, some kind of additional mixed-use development to inject a little bit of, of something different there, but you don't want to lose what, what's already there. Yeah. It's a challenge. What I also like about Annandale, it still has, like, some of these little cranky shops, right. fewer than it used to. Yeah. It's a kind of antiques barn sort yeah. of retail experience. Yeah. Yeah, there's it, it, you're, you can be surprised. You can still be surprised if you're walking or driving around Annandale in terms of what you're going to find. That's right. You want, you're not going to be surprised in Mosaic or in Tyson's. They're and wonderful, The old too. church on, I guess, Columbia Pike is very beautiful, I think. Annandale United Methodist. Yes, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's, let's, go, let's go from housing to the broader economic challenges and issues in Fairfax County, and I want to get your take and, and prescription. So uh, when I was 
sworn in one of our first meetings that we had in February of 2020. And I went back and watched the video and this is February, 2020. And we're all crammed together in the conference room up there, um, you know, 50, 100 people sitting very close to one another, which is this amazing thing to think about right now as we sit here today. But we had a great presentation um, from Jeanette Chapman uh, from George Mason University. And she um, threw a little bit of cold water on, you know, some of our economic triumphalism in the region and in the county. And she pointed out that between 2002 and 2018, uh, the D.C. region, the broader D.C. metropolitan region, had trailed uh, other fast-growing metro regions in uh, GRP, gross revenue product, mm -hmm. gross regional product growth. Uh, we were at 1.5% on an annualized basis. San Francisco at the high end was about 5%, but other metro areas, New York, Denver, Seattle were significantly higher than us as well. Um, she cited two factors. Uh, one was sequestration, obviously, which took, pay, took place in that time period, a significant reduction in discretionary spending from the federal government, which obviously um, hit our contracting and professional services industries hard. Uh, but she also cited a lack of uh, diversified private sector base and over-reliance on, on the federal government and spending, as well as an increasing aging in the region. So challenges in attracting young people. I would add in e-commerce, by the way. So Tyson's Corner, people used to write books about it with titles like Edge City glorifying it. Yeah. It still is fine. Nothing against Tyson's Corner, but it's not nearly as important in a world with Amazon. And I think that has stifled growth. The mall. By Tyson's Corner, you mean the, the mall. mall. But the yeah. area itself. Mm -hmm. So there's defense contractors. Defense spending at many times, not always, has been flat. Yeah. Uh, the retail. There's so much interest focused on Tyson's Mall. You may recall, like 20 years ago, there were so many shopping malls here. Mm -hmm. And now it's like Tyson's, Tyson's, Tyson's. But it's not that exciting a place to go. Again, yeah. no fault of the mall. I think they do a great job. But again, in a world where it's all at my fingertips, how often do I need to go to Tyson's? Right. The mall, the, it's a different experience. It's not the same experience it was going to a mall. It used to Tyson's. be an exciting place to go. Yeah, yeah. They, there was also a presentation from a guy named Jonathan Aberman um, from Marymount. And what he said, and this, uh, this struck me, and when I reread the complacent class, it struck me again. Um, he said the areas that are outpacing us have businesses with a different kind of business model. And they have a higher percentage of businesses with a model that can create disproportionate wealth opportunities. So while Northern Virginia is heavily entrepreneurial, it tends to be selling services, not products, right. including in IT. So we're selling cybersecurity services to the federal government, but we're not creating the businesses that will create the next software as a service product that will scale across across the globe. Do, does that strike you as accurate? I agree, and it, it's in our DNA not to be Elon Musk's, say, yeah. in Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. But that said, I'm much more optimistic about this area than I had been. So I agree we had a good 15 years of relative stagnation mm -hmm. for reasons we just discussed. But I think the last two years, it has snapped in a new direction so the trend had been, like everything in Arlington, not South Arlington necessarily, but everything in North Central Arlington would be worth much, much more. And then there was like an iron curtain past which uh, home prices were just flat. Mm -hmm. And now I think the world has decided uh, creators want to live in good places, and Fairfax County is a good place. So what happened to parts of Arlington County is happening here. With the pandemic, people have decided they want large homes, they want backyards, they want decks. Yeah. They don't want to live in Manhattan, even if their job is in Manhattan. So I think just the number of people who will find this a wonderful place to live and the number of kind of dormant shopping centers, strip malls that were slow, mm -hmm. two, three years, you didn't see much happening. As the pandemic was coming, a lot of those were starting to be rebuilt. I'm sure you've seen this mm -hmm. driving around like on Route 50. Mm -hmm. And that's a harbinger, of this bigger trend, and then Amazon coming. So those three things all at once, I think, mean that kind of the miracle of North Central Arlington is going to spread to most of Fairfax County. And I'm pretty optimistic now. 
even though I fully see that 15 years of relative stagnation. Is that a weakness, though, in our economic model that, and, you know, thinking about it in, the, in terms of, of the complacent class, do we have a business community um, <laughs> that on a certain level is complacent? And that, uh, that, that sounds more negative than I mean it. Um, but if you are a bright, uh, motivated entrepreneur or technologist in Northern Virginia, not that it's easy, but there's relatively low-hanging fruit in that you can start a business. You know, if it's an 8A, even better. Small business, minority, woman-owned, veteran-owned business, even better. And have reasonably good odds of success selling your IT service to the federal government and make a very decent living and have a successful business doing it. But you're not going to be the next, you know, pick Google, Facebook, Amazon, yeah. Uber, you're not, you're not going to do it. So are, are we going for the low-hanging fruit? And should we be thinking about how do we encourage our entrepreneurs to reach higher or to leverage maybe that base? You can establish your, your company through federal um, contracting and spending, but have a plan to, to try to take it to the next level. Or is that not necessary and not really worth it and we should keep doing what we're doing, which is very successful? I think we're stuck with the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly not against a plan to encourage people to do more, but I, I suppose I would bet against its success. But I think we have a new economic model, which we don't ourselves yet see. And the economic model is the proposition that this is one of the very best places in the world to live and with work from a distance. So people are trying, you know, Maine, West Virginia, but they're getting bored. But they, mm -hmm. they don't want Manhattan anymore, the Bay Area super expensive, quite problematic in other ways, school systems, crime. So people will come here more and more and just see it as all the cultural amenities, incredible restaurants, affordable by the standards of these people. In fact, it will look very cheap. Mm -hmm. And just great communities, multicultural, very tolerant, uh, sort of tolerance of gay rights and so on, or different mm -hmm. ethnic groups, or your embassy is just in DC. And that will be the boom of this area is we have one of the very best models where people should live, park system, public libraries, you could go on and on, you know all these things. And that has been like our little secret that we would brag about and the world wouldn't disagree, but they'd kind of snooze off. Yeah. And now it's like, hey, wait a minute. You know, why was I thinking of moving to Miami? I should move to Northern Virginia. And that's what I see as the future. Certainly better better weather here. Than better weather, no hurricanes, way better school system, yeah. much better in terms of crime. You could go on the list. Every amenity people care about is here. Yeah. Proximity to New York, Amtrak driving, whatever, uh, bus for that matter. It, very hard to beat here. Again, the three airports. You're very close to the southeast, which is increasingly becoming a kind of dominant American region in some ways. And people will want more and more to be close to the southeast, even though it doesn't have a Silicon Valley or a Wall Street. Now, let's let's related to that. Um, I want to get your thoughts on what the pandemic has taught us and in, uh, in, about remote work and your predictions for remote work and the impact on regional economies, including ours. And one of our strengths over the last decade, maybe longer, has been attracting corporate headquarters. Uh, major Fortune 500 companies, Amazon being the biggest example, but Amazon being kind of just the latest in a long line of examples, and a number of them are headquartered in Tyson's or Reston or that corridor with hundreds or thousands of good-paying, six-figure-plus jobs before the pandemic commuting to their offices and then commuting home. What has the pandemic taught us how dramatic will the shift to remote work be or not be? And what should um, places like Fairfax County and other regions that have been successful in convincing businesses to locate here, what does that mean for our future economic growth and challenges? If you take, say, those jobs, six-figure salary and up, I can easily imagine 20% of them being mostly remote forever. I'm not an extremist, people love face to face, many people are itching to get back to work, I see all that. Mm -hmm. But still at the end of the day, to think that what we've been doing 100% will end up totally viable at 20% does not 
stretch my imagination at all. I, I feel we know we can do 20 percent. And if once a month you, you know, take the train up to New York or drive to Wilmington or fly mm -hmm. to Atlanta, uh, great. So those people also over time will start businesses here, some of them, as they leave their current jobs. Mm -hmm. And simply, you know, the word getting out that this is a good place to live, I think is what will drive that. So I d I'm not sure the future of this area is to attract more companies. It may be the future is to attract more people. Yeah, and that uh, you know, I was I was just going to say that that sounds like the the kind of summary of the prediction and argument that you're making is, uh, and I think if you look at the history of Fairfax County, we we probably have tried to do both, and there certainly was a time in terms of you know being a tolerant and welcoming place. There was a time where it was important for us to create maybe a contradiction with what was going on in the rest of Virginia, right? We're, we're different. This is Northern Virginia. This is different. So we could attract the people that those companies wanted to have here as employees. That's always been part of it. But we also a very concerted effort to convince businesses this is the place to locate your physical headquarters, Tyson's, Reston, Fair Oaks, Arlington, et cetera. Uh, what you're saying is the focus now needs to be attracting people and convincing people of what you said when you came in before we went on, on live here, which is that Fairfax County is one of, if not the best place to live in the world. Correct. And I don't see why we can't do that. We don't even have to work that hard at it. I think it will just happen. Now, how do you do that? Because one of the things that I wonder about, you know, I, I grew up here in Northern Virginia and my dad was a plumber and my mom was a nurse, not the kind of nurse that made $80,000 a year, a home health care worker who never made a lot of money. And at, when I was growing up in the 80s and into the 90s, they could afford to live in Northern Virginia. We lived variously in Fairfax and Prince William. My sense, and I think the data suggests it, is that that would be a more difficult thing to pull off now. Housing costs have outstripped uh, certainly wage gains and even overall inflation. How, as we are attracting the people you described, um, who would be in that maybe top one to three percent of the uh, complacent class right. group, successful upper middle class families and households, as they see Northern Virginia as a place that they want to come, how can it still be a place that someone making 50 or si I won't even go lower than that, but making fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year can live. I'm not sure we'll succeed at that, but this gets back to the Pimmit Hills question. Yeah. Uh, just per, I'm not saying it's good for the world, but personally, I would be happier if we kept part of Fairfax County crummy. Mm -hmm. If you recall the old Route 29, some of which is still there, you would see all kinds of weird stuff driving along, right? Things that didn't make any sense, like how can this be? You know, right outside our nation's capital. Yeah. But it, it, it was there because the demand to push it off that land wasn't strong enough. So I, I hope we keep some of that maybe through our own incompetence or a conscious desire to keep part of it, quote unquote, crummy. But for me, that's attractive. Now, if I had Matt, Matt Iglesias here on the podcast, and maybe, maybe now that I got him, I'll get I'll start getting big names like like him. Sure. Now that I had you, I'll get big names like him. But I think he would say in response to that. Actually, if we want those people making fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year to be able to live in Fairfax County, we need to take those crummy parts, which are lower density, and increase the density and make overall housing more affordable, or at least exert some downward pressure on housing costs. Well, I, I completely favor doing that. But here's what I think would happen: uh, if we built up the whole parts of the area much more, uh, rents would go up. Now, that would be a sign that we were increasing value. We would say pull people away from North Carolina, Research Triangle, mm. and rents might go down a lot there. So we would succeed in producing cheaper housing somewhere. It'd be great for the world. But I don't know that we would do it here. Mm -hmm. It's just like if you built up Wall Street more, you might just make Wall Street more of a big deal. And again, that will somewhere in the broader system produce much cheaper housing for someone. But I'm not sure you're ever going to get cheaper housing on Wall Street. And we are, in a sense, the new Wall Street. Hmm. But I'm all for, you know, a lot more dense housing in Tyson's Corner or other places. Uh, but I don't think it's just going to make the rents cheaper. I think it's keeping some parts crummy 
a la Pimmit Hills, which, just to be clear, I really like. I don't right, actually right, think right, it's yeah. crummy. No, I it's understand. just my shorthand. Yeah. Uh, that's our best bet for keeping some parts cheap. Now, um, let's, from that, um, maybe somewhat related, uh, let's talk about George Mason University and uh, the future, not just of George Mason, but uh, of universities. And George Mason is important to me, obviously, because I represent the district with the neighborhoods surrounding it. So we have an intense interest on the future uh, of the campus and the university. And I, I spoke to President Washington not long ago and asked, what, what has George Mason learned from the pandemic? And I shared my, my observation that um, I think a strength of George Mason is its relative dynamism compared to other universities that are maybe more um, bound by their traditions and, and strictures. And that made George Mason maybe better prepared to adapt to this pandemic. And I asked him what had the, has he learned and how has it or will it impact the future of the university, growth of the university, the campus? And he said one thing that surprised me, I hadn't heard before, that um, in his observation, one third of the students desperately need the in-person experience, the socialization aspect of it, given the time that they're in in their lives or you know, for whatever emotional, normal human reasons, they, they need that in-person interaction and have suffered and struggled without it. The other two-thirds of students have, have thrived in the virtual environment. Is that your observation? Um, what do you think is the future of George Mason and universities like George Mason, given what we've learned during the pandemic? I would agree with his observation. I would stress that we've had one of the best pandemic performances of any university in terms of cases, hospitalizations, yeah. just people feeling they can still do their business also. Mm -hmm. So that has been a remarkable achievement uh, that he deserves a lot of credit for. But I think the future of many state universities, but especially George Mason, is that a higher percentage of classes will be fully online, not close to half, but something like 20, 25% will be fully online and automated forever. Hmm. Something like Econ Principles, Econ 101, Principles hmm. of Psychology will be, in a sense, in a box, and people will be able to take it all over the world. GMU students, but other students too, would be a, a major revenue source mm -hmm. for the school. And then you'll also free up time for your best faculty to teach more face-to-face, -face, interact with students, serve as mentors, because the classes that you can automate, you will automate. It saves human labor. The students can devote their time selectively to what they want to do. They don't have to always do the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, mm -hmm. 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. thing, which mm -hmm. they hate, I can assure you. Mm -hmm. And I think will be a much better school. And what's striking to me is that state schools like George Mason are better situated to do that than like Harvard, Princeton, mm -hmm. MIT. Mm -hmm. And in, in a direct competition, we're going to kick their butt. Yeah. And is it because those universities are selling the experience of being there on that campus, whereas a university like George Mason is selling the education that's offered. While that may be true, I don't think that's the reason. I would put it this way. They are selling exclusivity, mm -hmm. which, okay, that's what they are. But if you're exclusive, you're not open to the whole world. Mm -hmm. We are selling inclusivity. If that's what you're doing, it's naturally part of your culture to be open to the whole world. And, you know, Georgia Tech ha has started doing some of this, uh, University of Arizona, George Mason, and uh, it's going to work. So from the students' perspective, you, you just said 20% fully online. For, from the perspective of an individual student, that means I'm going to campus, but maybe not as often. Or if I live on campus, I'm taking some classes virtually and some I'm walking to take them in person. Exactly. Imagine your own college experience. If you could cut out the worst quarter of your classes, mm -hmm. from which I predict you learned nothing, <laughs> right. and replace it with online, which may still be imperfect. I don't yeah. think we should be utopian about this. Right. But it's just clearly a better deal, yeah. and we can make the product cheaper. Yeah, good. Okay, well, one thing I'll reveal about my college experience, and I'm, I'm going to ask you a question related to this later, but I, I, hate, I hate to say this to an economist. I got one C in college, and it was macroeconomics, so 
Maybe if I had taken you your class, I would have done better. <laughs> because macroeconomics <laughs> makes no sense. <laughs> okay, all right, good, good. Um, uh, Mercatus Center, I, I want to ask a, a question about the Mercatus Center. Sure. And, um, you know, I'm not an investigative journalist, so I'll try to not to make it a gotcha question. Mercatus Center is a libertarian, pro-free market uh, think tank. Some controversies related to, you know, donors and decisions, maybe or maybe not related to academic affairs. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, it has been described as the most important think tank you've never heard of. That was uh, a long time ago, that piece. People I know. have heard yep. of us by now. Great. That's right. Oh, and also ground zero for deregulation policy. And I get emails and reports from Mercatus Center, and I typically know when I open it, it's going to be some variation on the theme of regulations restrict or hinder economic growth. There's a, there's a perspective. Uh, but I just want to ask about one issue, and that's climate change. Uh, there's a, there was a 2004 uh, Mercatus Center paper that, that challenged the science of climate change, and I'll just, I'll just read it. I'll quote from it here. A new book from the American Legislative Exchange Council provides a comprehensive examination of the evidence regarding global warming and offers several interesting observations. First, it notes that the evidence regarding global warming is mixed and that as forecasts of anthropogenic warming gets more refined, they predict less extreme warming. The empirical evidence reviewed in this book also offers no scientific basis for dire predictions of rampant tropical diseases. On the contrary, data suggests that any warming that does occur will likely be at night in the winter and near the poles. If a slight warming does occur, Historical evidence suggests it is likely to be beneficial, stimulating plant growth and making humans better off. And I think that is representative of a lot of the Mercatus Center content around that time around climate change. And it's, it's an easy statement to, to refute today. I mean, if you just want to talk about evidence regarding global warming is mixed. You've seen the studies about the climate models that were produced from 1970 to 2017. 14 of 17 turned out to be accurate, et cetera, et cetera. That statement about climate change does not characterize what the Mercatus Center says today. Correct. Doesn't characterize. That piece is quite wrong. It was a big mistake. Okay. That was my, and it doesn't characterize, because I have seen you talk quite eloquently about climate change and, and your support of a carbon tax today. So that, that was my question. Did the Mercatus Center get it wrong on climate change in that era in the early 2000s? I would draw an important distinction. There are researchers who write for us. There's not a official Mercatus Center position on anything at all. Okay. Uh, so we made a mistake in commissioning that piece and in putting it out. But there's not a Mercatus view on climate change. Uh, as you mentioned, personally, I favor a carbon tax. I think our federal government should spend much more on R&D to help in some way fix or mitigate climate change. I think that's a much better position. Um, and now we generally just don't cover climate change. We feel it's an area that's not our comparative advantage, hmm. and we stay out of it. Mm -hmm. I've personally said things about climate change, yeah. but Mercatus Center is not putting out publications on that topic. Okay, a, a more fun topic, um, food. And I mentioned in your, in your bio, um, one of your many interests and strengths is as a foodie. And you have published for how many years the Ethnic Dining Guide? Oh, published maybe is too strong a word. No, it's not. 30, over 30 years. 30 years, okay. More, and slightly you, over 30 years. And I want to talk about a couple of uh, specific options that are in or around the Braddock District. But first, um, for our listeners, can you give us the rules um, for dining? And I can read to you the, the five rules that were outlined in an Atlantic article several years ago, and maybe you can explain them each, each to us. Number one, number one rule, in the fanciest restaurants, Order what sounds least appetizing. Why is that? That doesn't make any sense to me. That rule's a bit tongue-in-cheek. But look, if you eat out a fair amount, you're looking to try new things. So you can go to a top-quality restaurant, look at the menu, you'll see roast chicken and salmon. They're probably really good, right? There's a reason why those are on so many menus. 
but at the same time, you'll be a little bored, right? It won't challenge your palate. And if you see a dish you haven't heard of, or maybe actively sounds bad, has sweetbreads or something, uh, I'm telling people they ought to try it. So it's about getting out of your comfort zone. Getting out of your comfort zone. Okay. Now, at a bad restaurant, if it sounds disgusting, <laughs> it may just be disgusting. <laughs> okay. So the qualifier there is important. Okay. Uh, number two, beware the beautiful laughing women. Now, that one you have to explain to us. There are plenty of restaurants, especially in Washington, D.C., where people go for the bar scene, the single scene, to socialize, and they're perfectly good for that purpose. <clears throat> Some of them even have pretty good food, but they typically do not have the best food because they get by by being venues for socializing. And if you see attractive people sitting around having a good time, run the other way, unless Got that's it. what you want. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, three. Get out, and this is a good one for Fairfax County and for the Braddock District, get out of the city and into the strip mall. Why are the best dining experiences in strip malls and not downtown D.C.? Well, the rent is cheaper in strip malls, right, and the clientele is more diverse. And you have more immigration, more ethnic groups actually in the suburbs, and on average you have much better food. So uh, strip malls here are awesome. Just You can go to almost to any random strip mall, and there'll be one – at least pretty good place to eat in most of Fairfax County. How do it's I quite know, remarkable. How do I distinguish between the one pretty good place to eat and the, the you know, I'm not saying that any of these exist, certainly not in my district, but the second or third rate Chinese delivery takeout place? I think it's quite easy. So when you look at the menu, there's a set of dishes like General Tsao's chicken, orange chicken, that indicate it's just another takeout place. Now, even some of those restaurants will have secret Chinese menus. Mm. But if you don't get a hold of the secret menu, you're still stuck. If it's a regional Chinese restaurant and you see a menu with a lot of dishes, you either haven't heard of before or maybe you're an expert. You've heard of them, but you know they're different. Then, at least in Fairfax County, the chance it's good is very, very high. We have outstanding Chinese food here, and it's not just from one part of China anymore. Even something like mm -hmm. Sichuan, we not only have genuine, genuine Sichuan food, we have different varieties of Sichuan food, which are quite distinct. Sichuan province being what? The size of France, right? It's not all the same thing. It's not just Mapu Tofu. Next, um, acknowledge, I, I think the rule was exploit. I'll change it to acknowledge restaurant labor. So uh, I think you mean take into account the labor costs of a restaurant. Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes it may be family labor. Mm -hmm. If the restaurant has fairly cheap labor, there's more scope to experiment, to appeal to minority tastes. They're not just looking to turn over tables, which, again, in a K Street or high-rent district is more likely to be the case. If they're spending their money on ballet parkers, they're probably not spending their money on the menu. And if you go to, like, a cheesecake factory in a big mall, I mean, it's sort of okay, but, like, who needs to go there at this point, right? Number five, prefer Vietnamese to Thai. Why is Vietnamese food better than Thai food here? There are several truly excellent Thai places in Fairfax County. One of them is Elephant Jumps on Gallows mm -hmm. Road. Yeah. Great, great place. But so many Thai places have kind of sold out. Mm -hmm. They make the food too sweet. It's all about pod Thai. They emphasize something about the experience rather than the food itself. And again, they're typically okay. But they're becoming like those Chinese restaurants with the gooey sauces and too much takeout. Now, somebody told me, maybe is this an urban legend, that the, the Thai government actually subsidizes a lot of their restaurants here as tourism, promotion, brand equity. Is that, is that true? It is true, but I'm not sure how significant it is. Okay. I do think it's the actual market supporting most of those, and there may be some subsidy. But I don't think that's the main reason why they're there. They're there because Americans or, to, you know, people from Thailand want to buy that food. Now, Vietnamese and, and Korean food also, no one has figured out yet how to dumb it down. It may happen <laughs> someday. But right. like pho is pho, right? right. Uh, and it, they're both still around here really quite good. Now, before I forget this, the Ethnic Dining Guide, where can people find it? There are two versions. There's a blog version. Uh, Tyler's Ethnic Dining Guide dot com, or just Google Tyler Cowan's no, it's Tyler Cowan's Ethnic Dining Guide dot com. Google my name and Ethnic Dining Guide. Then there's an all-in-one HTML version, which is like 120 single-spaced pages, 
just like Blast of Overkill, you can download it and print it all out. And the someone has like created a, a map. There's a map as well. There's a map, yeah. yeah. I don't know how that works. It's like beyond me. <laughs> all right. Well, I used the map, and I found uh, the one restaurant from your dining guide that is in the Braddock District. You informed me that there's a, an additional one. Use noodles, but there's others noodles. too. Don't I wouldn't trust that map actually. Ah, okay. Because I think there have to be others, and uh, there's another Indian place in the same mall with Nanjing Bistro and Use Noodles that's pretty good. Okay. And there's a new Peruvian chicken place in that mall. Okay. So, so I need to look at the real guide, not the map, perhaps. Look at the real guide. Okay. I don't know the boundaries of your district, but it has to have more okay, than well, just Nanjing Bistro. I will look at the guide, but but the two that w that we certainly know, Nanjing Bistro, um, and that, uh, just like Use Noodles, which we're going to talk about also, is at 11212 Lee Highway, which is a shopping center next to the Walmart um, right. on 29 on Lee Highway there. And um, I'll just read briefly from your uh, review. Imagine a whole restaurant devoted to Chinese food as it is found in Nanjing. This place is a real deal. You do need to ask for the Chinese menu. Then simply order any dish that appears to have anything to do with Nanjing, such as the shredded tofu dish toward the end of the menu. And I went there several years ago, and this has been on your list for a while, and ordered just that. Uh, and it was very good. Highly recommended. And and uh, once we're both uh, vaccinated, I think my wife and I will go back there to Nanjing Bistro. And you have told me about used noodles, which I have not been to. So tell us about used noodles in the same shopping center as Nanjing Bistro. First, a note on Nanjing Bistro. Two notes. First, I've been to Nanjing to eat Nanjing food. Mm. And there is a lot of overlap. You're Not every dish, but at Nanjing Bistro, you, you are eating the real thing mm -hmm. if you get the Nanjing dishes. Second, what used to be the secret Chinese menu is now just the menu. Ah, okay. So you don't, that's okay. it, don't and you just get that. it. It's what they give you. Use noodles open during the pandemic. It is uh, quite crowded every day, fills up pretty early. It is Sichuan food, but whereas most Sichuan food around here and in the U.S. is from Chengdu, mm -hmm. uh, this is from the city, which is also now its own province, Chongqing. And it's recognizably Sichuan, but also a different style. And they do noodles in a different way. And it's one of the half dozen best places in Northern Virginia right now, I think. Wow. Very cheap, great mm -hmm. service. Okay. It's tiny. I mean, you'd better be vaccinated twice. They, right. No outside dining. Right. I don't want to tell you all to go there just yet. Right, right. But when the time comes, yeah. it is an A-plus restaurant. And menu recommendations. Everything that is spicy, okay. but everything there is good. Okay. And the specials, the Shaolong Bao, are the best in this area, including Maryland. And just the simple Chongqing noodles, which I think is the very first item on the menu. It's just a bowl of noodles with spice and egg and some greens. Best in the area. It's a wonderful place. I love it. And they're super nice, uh, exclusively Chinese clientele, at least until we did this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're gonna, they're going to be sold out for years after this. Um, Leo Strauss. Leo Strauss was, I guess you would call him a political philosopher who grew up in Central Europe but ended up at the University of Chicago. And among other things, he put forward the hypothesis that the great writers of the past wrote in a kind of code because they were afraid, in essence, of being canceled. Now, people used to think Strauss was crazy. They're like, why would all these people be afraid of being canceled? Anyone in 2021, Strauss has risen dramatically in status. It does seem pretty clear in most periods of history. A lot of thinkers are worried about being canceled. So the notion they didn't always say what they were thinking now is widely <laughs> accepted, although you may or may not agree with everything in particular he said. He, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, one of his fundamental kind of political theories um, was that modern liberalism, as he perceived it in the 20th century, tended toward either a kind of brutal nihilism, be something akin to authoritarianism, or a gentle nihilism, which he described as value-free aimlessness and hedonism. Is that, I mean, do you take that away from his work? I think one has to be careful reading Strauss, because Strauss uh -oh, himself... Uh-oh, okay, you have to have a Straussian be, reading of Strauss. I do correctly read him as a historical pessimist, mm -hmm. and I think he has a pretty classically 
Germanic Central European critique of the United States, which, to be fair, is somewhat true, mm -hmm. especially of American suburbia. Like, some of it is superficial. Maybe some of that superficiality we should embrace, but I do get where he's coming from. Uh, I do not share his historical pessimism. I think we've never had more opportunity. I'm not convinced we'll convert it into another few hundred years of just things being great. Uh, but I think people mistake new challenges for things falling apart. And right now we have some pretty big challenges. But if I compare it to, say, when I was a kid, when you had the communist empires, higher risk of nuclear war, uh, much more racism, yeah. you know, gay people couldn't even come out of the closet and so on and so on. I would rather have today's problems and he was more, he was more then. pessimistic than that. He was more pessimistic than that. Now, here I thought that I had uh, maybe exposed something because I tried to do a Straussian reading of the complacent class. Good. It has and... <laughs> a Straussian reading, and that's on purpose. <laughs> that's okay. So, so let me give you my Straussian reading of the complacent class is that your description of the complacent class is a different way of describing his gentle nihilism that was a result of modern liberalism and the American experiment. And you are, the thing that you're concerned about maybe being exposed for is arguing against the kind of sacrosanct idea of modern liberal democracy and maybe you want to replace it with, with something else, authoritarianism, anarcho-libertarianism, seasteading paradises for for all of us, is there a Straussian reading of the complacent class that's remotely like what I just described? I would say the Straussian reading of the complacent class is that complacency is good. And I have this whole big chapter at the beginning about how people don't move around. And here we are doing a podcast. And I'm telling <laughs> you, I've lived 35 years in Fairfax County. So I'm partly poking fun at myself. Right. Uh, that's the Straussian reading. Now, I favor experiments with charter cities, seasteading, mm -hmm. and the like, but I don't want to see them replace democracy. There's some experiments, like take Dubai. It seems to me it's worked. Like, I'm glad they did what they did. It's not democratic. I would prefer it as more democratic. But just being realistic, I'm still like, gee, I'm, I'm really glad Dubai happened much better than if it had just, you know, lain fallow. Uh, but there's a lot of evidence, I think, democracies have higher living standards, clearly much higher human rights, and are better for economic growth. So I have only in my life lived in democracies, mm -hmm. New Zealand, Germany, U.S., mm -hmm. and that's no accident. Um, reading. You, you are well known as a voracious reader, um, so I won't do what every other podcast host does and ask you how do you um, read so much or what are you reading right now, but I'll ask you this question. What should politicians or policymakers be reading that they aren't, other than Mercatus uh, papers? But should they be, because I, I get the sense, and I, you know, I spend a lot of time around um, politicians at a much higher level than me. Uh, it's very easy to get in a rut of reading uh, biographies and maybe 20th century American history. Even for myself, you know, if there's another Lincoln biography, it's the first thing that I go on Amazon and, and purchase. Um, but what should we be doing beyond that? And I know you are a student of and reader of, of art history and architecture. What should politicians be reading that they aren't and why? I think the returns to constructing very high quality Twitter feeds are high. Mm. And I don't mean about politics. If someone tweets Trump, Biden, whatever, I mean, that may have its use. But if you're in politics already, it's not what you need. Again, depending on your job, but people mm -hmm. who are tweeting about China, people who are tweeting about science, people who are tweeting about epidemiology right now, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, people who debate real estate on Twitter, right? So to pick the topics that matter and follow people who treat them in a mostly I wouldn't say apolitical, but non-political manner, right, who focus on analysis and facts. Mm -hmm. That's the thing people should do. Many politicians do it already. Uh, Jay Powell, who runs the Fed, he's been doing that for a long time. He's super well-informed. Mm -hmm. You get real diversity of opinion. It is data-oriented. Again, there's a wrong way to do it. If you find yourself getting mad at people, you've built the wrong feed. 
no Biden, no Trump, no like Democrats this, Republicans that. Yeah. I think that's the, if I can interrupt, that <laughs> is the challenge in the political realm with Twitter. And um, the challenge is that it's easy to convince yourself that, that the opinion that exists there is the broader opinion, right? And Especially you know, for the Democrats. Yeah, that's right. No, that's Twitter right. And they're like, Bernie Sanders is going to win. That's and right. It's like, yeah. didn't really work out that way, right? Yeah, no, that's 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 absolutely right. And it, so it's true there, but it, I think it's true in a lot of rooms. So I guess the challenge is constructing that feed so you're you're getting informed insights and opinions that even if they don't represent broader public opinion, still have value intellectually or, or substantively. That's right. There's a new test out. You can to test your Twitter feed. How much is left wing? How much is right wing? How oh much boy. is centrist? All right. And I had way more left wing than right wing. Right. It was like two to one, mm -hmm. and then some in the center. My center was quite small, so apparently I like the weirdos. <laughs> uh, and I would generally be thought of as more on the right, but right. Twitter's pretty to the left. Right. A lot of people on the right I know they read Twitter and they come away thinking the whole world is this woke witch hunt. Right. which is about to, you know, cut them off at the knees. Right. And I guess that's true for a few people, but a lot come away way too pessimistic. Yeah. How about books? So the Twitter advice is, is good advice. Not, not, maybe not easy to accomplish, but good advice. How about books or topics? Well, let's keep up the Fairfax County theme. Yeah. Go to one of the Fairfax County public libraries or Arlington County, mm -hmm. Mary Riley Stiles and Falls Church. Go to the new books shelf and just experiment. But I'm not sure we're living in an age of books so much. Mm. Um, I think we're living in an age of a blend. And the other thing I would recommend people do is to build some very good WhatsApp groups with small numbers of people and put it on seven-day automatic clear so you can not quite be totally frank, but be frank enough. And it has to be people you trust who are not going to be doing screenshots. Right. And... Uh, Talk about issues in an open way and then get on Clubhouse, which is an app. You need yeah. an iPhone to do it mm -hmm. and go to the rooms and just experiment. And you'll hear very smart, famous people talking about, you know, pick the topics you want. And in a sense, politicians over invest a bit in a bit in books. Mm. Oh, the biography of Benjamin Franklin. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Of course, I've read more than one of those. Yeah. But at the end of the day, as you implied, it's not what we need more of. Okay, uh, we're close to the end of our time here, and I want to do a quick round of underrated, overrated, Got which it. I've stolen from you. Uh, Braddock Road, underrated or overrated? Oh, you're not going to like my <laughs> answer. <laughs> I'm not sure how it's rated, but there's not enough good food on it ah, for okay. my taste. Yeah. But there is this Korean kind of mall center near the Beltway, which mm -hmm. hardly anyone goes to, and it's very good. So maybe in that funny sense, Braddock Road is underrated. Okay. But if you compare it to 236, 50, 29, yeah. it's much worse for food. And we need to fix that. And that's that's my charge for you. All Moving right. Forward. Good. Okay, good. Um, the classic suburban neighborhood of single family detached homes, you live in one, underrated or overrated? Well, the people who don't live in it underrate it. Mm -hmm. And the people who do live in it overrate it. But I think the the country as a whole is now seeing it's better than they had thought. And everyone I know who had lived in a city and who was sort of forced out is like, hey, I'm not going back. Yeah. So maybe now it's properly rated, but it had been underrated. This is certainly one where my Twitter feed, at least, is out of step with the real world reality in which in which I live, because um, my Twitter feed, at least, is filled with, um, you know, people who have very decided negative views on the single family detached home neighborhood. No, it's tremendous. It's it's one of the best things the world has produced. There is a big problem related to climate change and sustainability, which we should take seriously. Uh, there's a big problem of commuting costs, which we should take seriously. That one I think we can fix. Uh, but to live in it is one of the great glories of America and the people who do it in their hearts, I'll know that. The benefits of remote work, and I'll amend this slightly based on our having covered this already, the benefits of remote work for individuals. 
I think it depends a great deal on whether you have children at home and whether you are the so-called primary caretaker. Mm. If you have to juggle kids and working at home, I think it's a kind of a nightmare. But I think people know that. It's probably correctly underrated. If you can pick and choose, including across offices, I had a good discussion with Ed Boyden about this once. He teaches at MIT. He has two offices on purpose to meet up with different people, to have a different mm. desk, different open tabs. A home office, in part, gives you that. And I think the benefits of that are still underrated, subject to all the other caveats. Northern Virginia's economic dynamism, underrated, overrated. People for so long had talked up how great it is, and then they had this 15-year patch of stagnation, and I think learned the truth, but were still afraid to say it. And now that I think we've turned the corner, I think they're actually underrating it because they don't understand mm. yet uh, that this region is going to do just great. Okay. Um, that is all I have. Uh, Tyler, is there anything else about Fairfax County or Northern Virginia we haven't covered that uh, you think we should talk about? Well, I would just say if you don't live here, come and take a look, but you have to treat it as a very different kind of vacation. We do have a few sites, but it's not about seeing the sites. You're seeing a way that people live, and you have to drive around a lot, and you'll be confused as to why this is even a vacation at all. But I do think it's highly rewarding to just come and like stay here for three days mm -hmm. and treat it like a vacation. And you'll learn something about vacations as well and learn something about America. And most of all, learn something about Fairfax County. And maybe there's even a chance you'll decide to come live here. So right. I would recommend that people give that a try, get out of their complacency zone. And yes, Northern Virginia. All do right. It. Tourism promotion from uh, Dr. Tyler Cowan here. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, it's been uh, a really amazing and engaging conversation. We covered a lot of ground. We went a little bit over time, but that's okay. I want to thank our guest, Tyler Cowan uh, from George Mason University. Um, you can find him at the economics blog, Marginal Revolution, on Twitter, at Tyler Cowan. That's it, at Tyler, at Tyler Cowan, C-O-W-E-N. On, on Twitter, check out the Ethnic Dining Guide. There is at least one, potentially two, uh, Braddock District restaurants uh, there. And I want to thank you all the listeners for tuning in to Braddock Voices, where we talk to Braddock District and Fairfax County residents and leaders working to make our wonderful community even better. To stay up to date with future episodes, sign up for our email list. Email us at braddock at fairfaxcounty.gov and we will subscribe you. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.